Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. These are the list of articles which has been chosen for today's analysis. The link for the handwritten notes is provided in the description box below and it is also provided in the comment section. Let's move on to our first article discussion. Our first discussion is based on uh, article 371 of the constitution. The syllabus that can be linked to this discussion is given here for your reference. The news article mentions that the leaders in Jammu are complaining that the central government is going back on its promise. Now the promise was that the special status with respect to article 371 will be extended to Jammu also. The leaders are also saying that previously the government promised to protect their lands, properties and jobs in the form of article 371. Now even some 2-3 days back there were news that the Minister of Home Affairs is holding consultations with the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and with the Union Territory of Ladakh to grant them the special status on the lines of Article 371 of the Constitution. Now, according to this news article, based on this statement by Ministry of Home Affairs, a spokesman of the Jammu and Kashmir government has said that there was no proposal under consideration regarding the extension of Article 371 to the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, based on this statement only, the leaders in Jammu are complaining that the central government is going back on its promise. So, these are two contradicting statements. Ministry of Home Affairs is saying they are holding consultations, but the administration in the Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory is saying there is no proposal regarding this issue. Now, based on this, you would have confused that just a few months back only, our government abrogated or repealed the special status of the then state of Jammu and Kashmir. Then what is this new special status? Now that special status was with respect to article 370 of the constitution. The special status which we are talking now is with respect to the series of provisions under article 371 which is the just next article to article 370. Even if you would notice the actual provisions in the constitution the article 370 mentions that temporary provisions with respect to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. It does not mention special provisions. But the article 371 and its series deals with special provision with respect to certain different states of our country. Now in this line only the issue is going on with respect to extending the special status to the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. So in this context now let us discuss the provisions in article 371 series of the constitution. Now you may be thinking why I keep mentioning it as series. It is because the articles from article 371 to article 371 capital J they contain special provisions for 12 states. Now these provisions come under part 21 of the constitution. So now let us see which are these 12 states and we will see these states in the same order based on the provisions in the constitution. They are the state of Maharashtra and Gujarat which is provided in article 371. Then Nagaland gets special provisions under article 371 capital A. Then comes Assam under article 371 capital B. Then is Manipur under article 371 capital C. Next is Andhra Pradesh or Telangana under article 371 capital D. Then is Sikkim which gets special provisions under article 371 capital F. Then comes Mizoram which gets special provisions under article 371 capital G. Then for Anachal Pradesh it is under article 371 capital H. And then for Goa it is article 371 capital I. And final one is for the state of Karnataka which is provided under article 371 capital J. Now you may be thinking how to remember these 12 states. You can remember it like uh, 6 states from northeast have special provisions along with 6 other states in the country except the states of Meghalaya and Tripura in the northeastern states. Now let us see the intention behind this special provisions in the constitution for these states. Now the first intention is to meet the aspirations of the people of backward regions of these states. Then next is to protect the cultural and economic interests of tribal people belonging to these states. The next intention is also to deal with the disturbed law and order condition in some parts of these states. Then next is to protect the interests of the local people of these states. So these are the intentions behind the special provisions in the constitution for these 12 states. But if you see originally the constitution did not make any special provisions for these states. 
they have been incorporated into the constitution by various subsequent amendments which were made in the context of uh, reorganization of the states or in the context of conferment of the statehood on the union territories. Now, you could have understood this by seeing the provisions because uh, it is mentioned as 371 capital A, capital B, capital C. When we use capital letters in the constitution, it, it means it is a provision which has been incorporated by an amendment. Now, since recently the then state of Jammu and Kashmir has been reorganized into two union territories, based on these lines, the government is planning for special provisions. Now, among these provisions, we have covered in detail about Article 371 capital F, which deals with the state of Sikkim. We have covered it on 10th August 2019, Hindu News Analysis. Please have a look at it for better understanding. And we will cover the remaining special provisions with respect to other states on some other day. With this, we come to the end of this news article discussion. The spread practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article discussion, which is based on National Population Register. The syllabus that can be linked to this discussion is given here for your reference. The news article mentions that the West Bengal state government has withdrew activities which are related to the National Population Register. Now, in this regard, the West Bengal government has issued an order stating that no activity regarding NPR, that is National Population Register, may be taken up without prior clearance. Now, you would have also heard that uh, uh, there are already protests going on in the state to stop the NPR process. Now, based on this, the state government has also put a stay on the process. Now, the protest is going on because some are stating that the NPR is the first step to initiate the National Register of Citizens in the state of West Bengal. And the protest is also with respect to a provision regarding the doubtful citizens. This provision is mentioned in the Citizenship Registration of Citizens and Issue of National Identity Cards Rules of 2003. Based on these rules, only the NPR is being prepared. We will discuss about this particular provision about doubtful citizen later in the discussion. Now, let us first discuss about the National Population Register or NPR. Now, it is a register of usual residents of the country and this National Population Register is a comprehensive identity database and these two are the objective of this NPR because the objective states that to create a comprehensive identity database of every usual resident in the country. Now, this register is to be maintained by the Registrar General and Census Commissioner of India who works under the Ministry of Home Affairs. Now, this database will contain demographic details and also biometric details and then Aadhaar details. Now, here by demographic details or particulars, we mean the uh, name of person, father's name, date of birth, marital status, place of birth, nationality, etc. And by biometric particulars, we mean fingerprints, etc. So, now you may be thinking why there is a need for such a register. Now, it is because the creation of this uh, National Population Register is the first step towards the preparation of National Register of Indian Citizens. Now, this is as per section 14 capital A of Citizenship Act of 1955. Under this section, it is compulsory for every citizen of the country to register in the National Register of Indian Citizens. For that purpose only, as a first step, the National Population Register is being created. Now, for the preparation of this NRIC, out of the universal data set of residents, the subset of citizens will be derived after due verification of the citizenship status. Therefore, it is compulsory for all usual residents to register under the National Population Register. Now, what do we mean by usual residents? Under NPR, a usual resident is defined as a person who has resided in a local area for the past six months or more or even a person who intends to reside in that area for the next six months or more. And also know that this NPR is being prepared at the local level that is at the village or subtown level, then on uh, sub-district level and then on district level, state level and national level. And it is prepared under the provisions of Citizenship Act of 1955 and the Citizenship Rules of 2003 as we saw earlier. This is the Citizenship Registration of Citizens and Issue of National Identity Cards Rules of 2003. Now, under these rules, there is one provision which deals with preparation of the National Register of Indian Citizens. It is based on Section 4 of this 2003 rules. 
under uh, subsection 4 of this section it is mentioned that during the verification process particulars of such individuals whose citizenship is doubtful shall be entered by the local registrar with appropriate remark in the population register for further enquiry and when there is a case of doubtful citizenship then the individual or the family has to be informed immediately after the verification process now the problem here is that there is uh, no indication of what makes a person as a doubtful citizen so that is why protests are going on in the state of west bengal they are stating that this provision is uh, non transparent and it is arbitrary so they are demanding clarity on this provision so this was about the doubtful citizens under these uh, 2003 rules now coming back to national population register you may think why there is a need for such a register according to the government this register which is a comprehensive identity database will help in better targeting of the benefits and services under the government schemes and government programs and it will also help in improving the planning and it will help to strengthen the security of the country and also remember that this process is being done for the first time in the country now after discussing about uh, the features of this npr you may think that this is looking similar to a census exercise but remember that the npr exercise is different from the census see initially the data for national population register was collected in 2010 and it was collected along with the house listing phase of census of india of 2011 so both were collected side by side and after this 2010 process update process was done during 2015 and it was done by conducting a door to door survey and after this the digitization of the updated information has also been completed so based on this the national population register will have the data of every person who was enumerated during the census operations irrespective of the age so it would also have the biometric data and the uid number of every person 15 years age and above and after this a national identity card will be given to all usual residents in a phased manner and it will be given by the office of registrar general and census commissioner of india now initially we saw that the database will contain demographic data biometric data and aadhar number so what is the link between npr and aadhar see the data which is collected in npr will be sent to the unique identity authority of india that is uidai and it will be sent for de duplication and for the issue of aadhar number which is uid so based on this all the duplicates will be eliminated at this stage based on the comparison of biometrics and after that unique id numbers will also be generated for every person so now there will be a cleaned database which will not have any duplication now this cleaned database along with the uid number will be sent back to the office of the registrar general and census commissioner of india and this database will form the national population register now you may be thinking if it will have the biometric data and the uid number of person who is of age of 15 years or above then what about those who are below the age of 15 years because for them biometrics will not be available then in that case the uid number will be linked to the parent or the guardian of those children now since this process is very detailed that is why the people in west bengal are fearing that this npr is a first step to initiate the national register of citizens which happened in the state of assam so that is all you should know about this news article and about national population register With this, we come to the end of this news article discussion. The split practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next discussion, which is based on these two news articles. These news articles talk about certain pollution control technologies that will help to combat the air pollution in Delhi. The syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. Now we know that the air pollution in Delhi is very severe. Now based on this the supreme court directed the center to constitute a high level committee last month now this high level committee was to consider and work out the modalities for using different technologies like smog tower and other such technologies which can help in combating air pollution now based on this the high level committee has suggested certain new technologies to the supreme court yesterday in this context the supreme court has told the central government and the government of delhi to finish the pilot project of setting up a smog tower within 3 months 
So, in this context, let us first discuss about the concept of smoke towers and let us also discuss the technologies that is suggested by the high level committee. First, let us see the concept of smoke towers. Now, this concept was first conceptualized in 2016 by a Beijing based Dutch designer. He designed an air purifier and he temporarily located that air purifier in a former industrial area in Beijing, China. Now, this tower was named as smog free tower. It is a 7 meter tall aluminum high tower as you can see in this picture. Now, this tower inhales the polluted air and it cleans at nano level by using a patented technology. This technology is called as the positive ionization technology. Now, since this is a patented technology, uh, we do not know how this technology works. So, just know that it works on positive ionization technology. And further, this smog free tower runs on wind power. So, we can say that it runs on green electricity. Now, the major positive which is stated is that this smog free tower captures and collects roughly about 50 percent of uh, PM 2.5 pollutant and 70 percentage of the PM 10 pollutant that is particulate matter 2.5 and particulate matter 10 and these are present in the polluted air we know that. Now, after collecting these pollutants this air purifier purifies the air and releases clean air around the tower and it is said that this tower has a 360 degree coverage. So, it creates an almost circular zone of clean air in its surrounding. So, producing clean air is the first part of this smog free tower project. Now, we know that the polluted air also contains carbon particles. So, these carbon particles are turned into diamond by artificial process and this is the second part of this project. Now, based on this technology, China came up with a similar smog tower project in the city of Xi'an. The scientists at China's Institute of Earth Environment constructed a, a tower which is said to be the world's largest air purifier. Now, this experimental smog sucking tower is over 100 meters tall as you can see in this picture. So, how does this tower works? This tower has a series of greenhouses which are situated at the base of this tower. These greenhouses suck in the polluted air and then heat it using solar energy. So, the polluted air rises through the layers of cleaning filters. Once it passes through the cleaning filters, the polluted air becomes a clean air and then it is released into the atmosphere. Now, based on these uh, smog tower technologies, even the high level committee has suggested for setting up of an 20 meter high smog tower with air purifiers in Delhi. Now, the proposal given by the high level committee mentions that by installing this tower, 65 percentage of reduction in pollution can be achieved on an average up to an area of 700 meters from the tower. So, around 700 meters from the tower, 65 percentage of the air pollution can be reduced if this smoke tower is installed. In addition to this, the installation of this tower is expected to influence air quality of more than 1 kilometer in the downwind direction. When we say downwind, we mean towards or along with the course of the wind. So, along the course of the wind to more than 1 kilometer, the air quality will be influenced. That means, the air quality will be much better. So, this was one suggestion given by the high level committee. Now, another suggestion given by the high level committee is to paint roads with photocatalytic coating to clean the air. Now, the news article mentions that these uh, photocatalytic paints have been used in the parks of Dubai and also in Mexico. So, what is this photocatalytic coating? These photocatalytic coating can remove pollutants from the air in presence of sunlight and ultraviolet rays. This photocatalytic coating can be applied on a range of surfaces such as it can be applied in roofing tiles and even on the surface of roads. So, based on this only, the high level committee has suggested to paint this on the roads. Now, once the surface is painted with photocatalytic coating, then they convert the pollutants into harmless substances. Now, these harmless substances can be washed off by means of rain or by flushing the water. So, what does these photocatalytic paints actually contain? It contains titanium dioxide. This titanium dioxide acts as a catalyst when it is exposed to UV rays and it removes atmospheric pollutants. 
This catalyst is the substance which converts the pollutants into other harmless species. Now, regarding this photocatalytic coating, the high level committee has suggested that a pilot study may be undertaken by institutions to find out the effectiveness of such photocatalytic paints using nanomaterials for cleaning ambient air. Now, this is because there is one possible issue with these photocatalytic paints. It is that there is a risk that this process may result in production of other undesirable substances such as uh, there may be creation of nitrous acid and formaldehyde. Now, these substances are likely to cause adverse health impacts. Now, that is why the high level committee has suggested to conduct a pilot study based on this photocatalytic paints. Now, the next suggestion given by the high level committee is to use the anti smog guns at construction sites. Now, this is to reduce the dust pollution which is created by the construction sites. Now, this anti smog gun is a device that sprays nebulized water droplets into the air through high pressure propellers. Here, nebulized means to produce a fine spray of liquid. So, the nebulized water droplets are sprayed in high pressure. Now, when this nebulized water is sprayed in high pressure, it helps the polluted air particles to settle down. So, based on this technology, the high level committee has informed the Supreme Court that the anti smog guns may be effective in controlling the localized dust. So, that means it will be more suitable in high dust emission zones such as large construction sites. Now, apart from these technologies, the high level committee also recommended the using of uh, wireless sensors and laser methods for monitoring pollution. So, these are some of the suggestions given by the high level committee to address the air pollution in Delhi. In this discussion, we discussed about the smog tower concept, then the suggestions given by high level committee to address the air pollution in Delhi. With this, we come to the end of this news article discussion. The respect practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article discussion, which is about the decision of Madras High Court to reserve its orders on a plea to remove the governor of Tamil Nadu. This discussion can be linked to the syllabus that is given here for your reference. Now, before discussing the news article, let us discuss in brief about the constitutional provision of governor. The constitutional provision of article 153 provides for a governors of states. It mentions that there shall be a governor for each state and additionally it also notes that the same person who has been appointed as the governor of a particular state shall be appointed as a governor for two or more states also. And followed by this article there is article 154 which talks about the executive power of state. It mentions that the executive power of the state shall be vested in the governor and it shall be exercised by her either directly or through officers who are subordinate to her in accordance with this constitution. That is why the governor is a part of state executive and he is a part of state executive along with the chief minister, the council of ministers and the advocate general of the state. And also remember that governor is the chief executive head of the state. Now, we say that the office of the governor has a dual role. It is because like the president of India, she is the nominal head or the titular head or the constitutional head of the state. And also the governor acts as an agent of the center in the state. So, that is why we say the office of governor has a dual role. Now, next let us discuss about the appointment of the governor. Now, see the governor is neither directly elected by the people nor indirectly elected by a specially constituted electoral college like in the case of president. So, how is governor appointed? Governor is appointed by the president based on the recommendation of the state. So, in this way she is a nominee or agent of the central government. But in this context, the Supreme Court has held that the office of governor of a state is not an employment under the central government. And also, the office of the governor is an independent constitutional office and it is not under the control of central government or it is neither and it is not subordinate to the central government. So, now who can be appointed as a governor? That is, what is the qualification required to be appointed as a governor? Based on constitution, there are two qualifications for the appointment of a person as a governor. First, she should be a citizen of India 
and second she should have completed the age of 35 years but in addition to this there are also conventions which were developed in this regard over the years so two conventions are normally followed first is that she should be an outsider that is the governor should not belong to the state where she is being appointed this is because to ensure that the governor is free from the local politics and secondly while appointing the governor the president is required to consult the chief minister of the state that is concerned now this is to ensure a smooth functioning of the constitutional machinery in the state but however we know that both the conventions have been violated in some of the cases in addition to this our constitution has also laid down several conditions for the governor's office like uh, the governor who is appointed should not be a member of either house of the parliament or either house of the state legislature and if any such person is appointed as governor who is a member of uh, house of parliament or uh, house of state legislature then she is deemed to have vacated her seat in that particular house on the date on which she enters upon her office as the governor and other conditions are like she should not hold any other office of profit and she is entitled to emoluments allowances and privileges which may be determined by the parliament and more importantly her emoluments and uh, allowances cannot be diminished during the term of office of the governor so what is the term of office of the governor the article 156 of the constitution deals with the term of office of the governor according to this article a governor holds office for a term of 5 years from the date on which she enters upon her office however this term of 5 years is subject to the pleasure of the president now in this context the supreme court has held that the pleasure of president is not justifiable and also the constitution does not lay down any grounds upon which a governor may be removed by the president that means governor may be removed by the president at any time hence we can say that the governor has no security of tenure and no fixed term of office in addition to this if the governor wants to resign at any time it can be done by addressing a resignation letter to the president so now you know that there is no constitutional provision which talks about the grounds upon which a governor may be removed by the president and our today's discussion is also based on this only because a plea was filed in the madras high court to remove the governor of tamil nadu and the reason stated for this plea is that he failed to follow the aid and advice of the council of ministers now according to the news article the issue is that the state cabinet of tamil nadu had recommended the release of all seven life convicts who were convicted in the assassination case of former uh, prime minister rajiv gandhi but the governor has not taken any decision on this recommendation so the petitioner has alleged that the governor has failed in his constitutional duty by not acting on the aid and advice of the council of ministers now here by constitutional duty the petitioner is referring to article 163 this article states that there shall be council of ministers with the chief minister as the head to aid and advise the governor in the exercise of her functions and this is also except in the cases in which to the extent that she is required to exercise her functions in her discretion so other than when the governor is required to act in her discretion the governor has to exercise her functions based on the aid and advice of the council of ministers headed by the chief minister so keeping this constitutional provision in mind the petitioner is claiming that the governor of the state of tamil nadu has failed in his constitutional duty now in this regard the high court has stated that there is no law which prescribes a time limit within which a governor was supposed to act as per the aid and advice of the council of minister and the court also added that it was not empowered to issue a direction to the governor to act upon the cabinet recommendation within a stipulated period it is because as we have already discussed the governor holds office during the pressure of the president as per article 156 and in this the judiciary is not involved in removing the governor so in this context the court has reserved its orders based on this plea petition so these are the information that you should know with respect to this news article in this discussion we discussed about the constitutional provisions related to governor appointment of governor and the term of office of governor and the removal of governor with this we come to the end of this news article discussion 
the split practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the last discussion for the day which is based on this editorial. This editorial talks about the outcomes of COP25. This discussion can be linked to the syllabus that is given here for your reference. Now we know that the COP25 was held at Madrid and it was held from 2nd to 13th December. Now the key objective of this COP25 was to complete several matters with respect to the full operationalization of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Now in this context, the editorial speaks about the failure of COP25 to finalize the rule book of the Paris Agreement. It is because this rule book is the operating manual of the Paris deal. Now this rule book is essential for the parties of the Paris Agreement to implement the agreement. Therefore, a comprehensive rule book is needed to implement the Paris Agreement. Now we are saying that the Madrid conference has failed to make the rule book because in the COP24 which was held at Katowice in Poland last year, it was agreed based on the guidelines of the COP24 that they will make the rule book for this Paris Agreement. But even in COP25, the rule book was not finalized. Now based on this failure only, the editorial is titled as the climate of inaction. Now not only the COP25 has failed to finalize the rule book for the implementation of the Paris Agreement, but it has also failed to frame the rules for carbon trading under the Article 6 of Paris deal. Now we have discussed about this Article 6 of Paris Agreement in detail on our 3rd December 2019 Hindu News Analysis. The link is given in the description box and also in the comment section. Please have a look at it for better understanding. Now in the context of carbon trading, the author mentions in the editorial that some countries are eager to cash in on the poorly audited emission savings from the clean development mechanism of the Kyoto Protocol. So what does author mean here? See the clean development mechanism or CDM is based on the Kyoto Protocol. It allows a country which has an emission reduction commitment or which has emission limitation commitment to implement an emission reduction project in a developing country. Now this clean development mechanism based on Kyoto Protocol is the first global environmental investment and it is the first credit scheme of its kind. Now the projects which are based on this CDM can earn saleable certified emission reduction credits. These are saleable so these credits can be encashed by those countries. Each certified emission reduction credit is equivalent to 1 ton of the carbon dioxide which can be counted towards meeting the Kyoto Protocol targets. Now the problem is that most of the CDM projects are implemented in China and in India and these projects are poorly audited. For example, you can take projects like electrification project using solar panels or installation of more efficient boilers etc. Now in these kinds of projects because of poor auditing there is no means to know whether really the project was implemented or really the project achieved its objectives or not. Now just to earn the certified emission reduction credits the countries are implementing projects. Based on this only author is saying that some countries are eager to cash in on poorly audited emission savings from the clean development mechanism of the Kyoto Protocol. Now since the COP25 has failed to agree on carbon trading mechanism under the Paris Agreement, it will also have impact on the ongoing CDM projects in the developing nations because there is a possibility that another procedural failures like uh, poor auditing can continue. Now after this in the editorial the author also mentions about a deal which will be closely studied by the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that is UNFCC and this will be studied to minimize the impact of the consequences of the climate change. Now we know that the consequences uh, of climate change include death and destruction by frequent storms, floods and droughts etc. Now the deal which we are talking about is the European Green Deal. This European Green Deal aims to make the 28 countries in the European Union as climate neutral by the year 2050. Now here climate neutrality means emissions will yield no net impact on the climate. Now this deal is important because the European Union has committed under the Paris Agreement to curb its emissions to 40% below the 1990 levels and this has to be done by the year 2030. 
but we know that there is no definite goal for the year 2050 under Paris Climate Agreement. But the same is provided by this European Green Deal. This European Green Deal raises the 2030 target to 50 percent reductions and it also sets the 2050 target at 100 percentage reduction. Therefore, we can say that it is a drastic increase in the climate change ambition from the European Union side to accomplish climate neutrality by the year 2050. Now, that is why the parties to the UNFCC shall learn lessons from the European Green Deal so that the impact of the consequences of the climate change can be minimized. Now, in addition to this, the author has also suggested some measures to reduce the impact of the consequences of climate change, such as uh, the member nations should raise about $100 billion per year by the year 2020 for the developing countries so that they can meet their targets. And these developing countries are the countries which have already committed itself in 2009 at the COP15, which was held in Copenhagen. Then the author also suggests for creating a strong framework to address the losses and damage from climate events. Then he also suggests to have some measures that is required for transferring the technology to poorer countries on reasonable terms. Now, with respect to India, author has stressed to shift away from fossil fuel use and that too as soon as possible. And even author has called for higher carbon reduction targets for India by 2020 and beyond. And he has also suggested that India should involve its states for mitigating the effects of climate change and also to involve them in the adaptation efforts to achieve the targets. So finally, as a conclusion, the author has mentioned that the outcome of the COP25 was desultory. It means that there was a lack of definite plan or purpose as a result of this conference. So that is all about this editorial discussion. With this, we have come to the end of our news article discussion sessions. The displayed practice question will be discussed in the next session, which is the practice questions discussion session. Now, this first question is based on part 21 of the constitution. It states the part 21 of the constitution of India deals with the temporary transitional and special provisions, which among the following are granted special provision under article 371 to article 371J of part 21. All the northeastern states, Jammu and Kashmir, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, then Gujarat and Maharashtra, all the union territories. Now, we have to choose the options for which special provisions are mentioned from this article to this article. Now, the first option is all the northeastern states. Now, remember that not all the northeastern states are included. Only six northeastern states are included. They are Nagaland, Assam, Manipur, Sikkim, Mizoram and Arunachal Pradesh. So, Meghalaya and Tripura are not provided any special provisions under this part of the constitution. So, you can eliminate uh, one from the given options. So, you can eliminate option A and D. And even if you do not know that whether all the northeastern states are uh, included or not, you can simply eliminate 5 because from article 371 to article 371J, 12 states are being given special provisions. Until now, no union territory has been given special provisions under these articles. So, you can eliminate option A and D from that also because 5 should not be in the options. Now, from the options, you can clearly say that 3 and 4 are directly included. Now, you have to just make sure whether 2 is present or not, whether Jammu and Kashmir has a special provision under this article or not. Now, see, Jammu and Kashmir had a temporary provision under article 370, but it was abrogated by the central government recently. And that article 370 was also under part 21 only. So, do not get confused because it was under article 370, not article 371 to article 371J. So, you have to eliminate 2 also. So, the correct answer to this question is option C, 3 and 4 only. Now, this next question is based on national population register. First statement states, it is the first step towards the preparation of national register of Indian citizens. Yes, this statement is correct. It is because as per section 14A of Citizenship Act of 1955, it is compulsory for every citizen of the country to register in the National Register of Indian Citizens. Now, the creation of this NPR is the first step towards the preparation of National Register of Indian Citizens. So, this statement is correct. The next statement states, it is prepared under the provisions of constitution. Now, this statement is wrong because 
This NPR is prepared under the provisions of Citizenship Act of 1955 and the Citizenship Registration of Citizens and Issue of National Identity Cards Rule of 2003. It is not based on the provisions of Constitution. So here the question asks for the correct statement. So the final correct answer to this question is option A1 only. Now this question is with respect to governor of a state. Four statements are given and we have to choose the incorrect statement. The first statement is governor is the constitutional head of the state and part of the state executive. Yes, governor is the constitutional head of the state and he is also an agent of the center in the state. And he is also a part of state executive along with the chief minister, council of ministers and the advocate general of the state. So this statement is correct. Now the second statement states the same person can be appointed as the governor for two or more states. Now this statement is also correct because as per article 153 there shall be a governor for each state and the same person can be appointed as governor for two or more states. Now the third statement states the governor is appointed by the president with a security of tenure of five years. Yes the governor is appointed by the president based on the recommendation of the central government. And as per article 156, a governor holds office for a term of five years from the date on which she enters upon her office. So based on this, you should not think that this statement is correct because this statement is wrong as the governor holds the office subject to the pleasure of the president, which means that the governor can be removed by the president at any time. So there is no security of tenure or no fixed term of office. Here the question asks for the incorrect statement. So this is the correct answer to this question. Now this question is based on clean development mechanism as per Kyoto protocol. Two statements are given and we have to choose the correct statement. First statement states it allows a country with an emission reduction or emission limitation commitment to implement emission reduction projects in developing countries. Now this statement is correct. This is the main objective of clean development mechanism. Now the second statement states the project under CDM can earn saleable certified emission reduction credits and each CER credit is equal to 1000 tons of carbon dioxide. Here this first half of the statement is correct. This is one of the aim of this uh, CDM but the second half is wrong because each CER credit is equal to 1 ton of carbon dioxide and not equal to 1000 tons of carbon dioxide. So this makes the whole statement as incorrect. Hence the final correct answer to this question is option A1 only. Now let us see one main question based on GS paper 3. From smog hanging over the cities to smoke inside the home, air pollution poses a major threat to health and climate. In the context of the above statement, suggest specific measures to reduce air pollution in Delhi. Now while answering this question, don't spend much time on justifying this statement because based on this statement, you have to suggest measures only. So just try to write two or three lines on the statement only then you can directly list out the measures and you can list out some short term and medium term measures such as uh, installation of smog free towers in crowded places of Delhi like how it was installed in Beijing and Xi'an in China. Then you can uh, also suggest a measure of photocatalytic coating on road surfaces in Delhi to reduce pollution. Then you can suggest a measure of anti-smog guns which can be used in construction areas. Then you can also suggest the continuation of odd even scheme which is uh, already implemented in Delhi. Now as a long term measure you can mention that state can switch to clean energy sources and you can also suggest to limit the usage of four wheelers and they can also develop strict building codes and they can ensure the implementation of the same codes. Then as a long term measure participation of the community can be encouraged in combating air pollution and as a long term measure you can also suggest for more investment by the central government in promoting green projects and green technology in the capital. So like this you can also add your own viewpoints based on your understanding. With this we have come to the end of today's sessions. If you like the video don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation.